red bar graph. We are not yet where we were back in May and June, early June of this year, but we do continue that steady decline and that is really reassuring. Um, as expected, there is also a steady decline in the number of deaths that we are seeing. There was an anomaly um, yesterday um, in the number of deaths reported two days ago. However, for the most part, the deaths have also continued a steady decline. Um, so that is also reassuring. Um, we can move to the next slide. So the next slide looks at our dashboard. So looking at the cases across the country, we have about 20 cases of COVID for every 1,000 individuals. That puts us at about one in every 50 individuals um, that have gotten COVID at one point or another across the country. Texas has 23 cases for every 1,000 people, so we're above the average of the country. Tri-County area looks to be about 18.5. And if you extrapolate Brewster County out of the Tri-County population, we're actually well above it. We're at about 25 cases out of every 1,000 individuals. And looking at testing, um, we can only continue to find cases if we have robust testing. And testing across the country, we have 278 tests for every 1,000 people. Texas has fallen to the ninth worst state in testing. We were holding steady about the 13th worst state in testing, and we've slowly slid to 10th and then now 9th. Um, we're doing about 206 tests for every thousand people. Tri-County we're doing a, um, well above that. We're doing about 300 tests for every 1,000 people. So that has been um, really robust testing and I hope we do continue to do that. Looking at the 232 current and we're actually at 233 now um, cases for Brewster County, there are 16 active cases that we are monitoring and there are three deaths. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so looking at those 233 cases, um, the top left-hand corner graph shows the ages of all of our COVID positive individuals. The most prominent increase is in our 10 to 19 year old age group. Um, that has increased quite a bit as well as our 20s um, age group. We do have quite a few cases currently in Sol Ross. And if you look at our top right-hand corner dashboard, starting from when we first had our outbreak in June, um, you can see once we got over that outbreak, we had a small surge in towards the end of July, and then we flattened out quite a bit, almost to nothing, and then we have had another surge that's outlined in red dashed lines. And if you look at the bottom center graph, you, I pulled out the number of active cases over the last 20 days, and I'm showing you where we've been. I'm just blowing that section up. Um, so we are currently at um, somewhere around, we've been hovering between about 13 to 16 cases for the most part. And what's interesting is that as some of the older cases recover, um, it is, we're finding some new cases in the community. So it's almost replacing it. And that's why we've almost plateaued for such a long time as, as somebody recovers and falls out of the active cases count, somebody else comes in and we find somebody else so, who's positive. So that's where we're at. We, as you can see, still have not hit our downhill slope. We have not had a steady decline yet. Um, hopefully that will come soon, um, but nothing quite yet. And um, if you wanna go down to the next slide. Um, as always, I have the five key metrics. There's a lot of uh, schools of public health, including Johns Hopkins, Brown, Duke, that have put together some goals for us to follow, for to know that we're doing a good job. And this outlines that. And if you go to the next, my last slide, um, I actually made it really easy to look at these metrics. So it actually looks at um, our Brewster County metrics and looks at uh, what our goals are and which ones we meet and don't meet. So mm -hmm. currently we are meeting two out of the five, which is not great. Um, we currently have 0% occupancy in our ICU, which is good. That means we have beds um, available and ready to use if we do need ICU beds available for patients. Um, in terms of our new and active infections, the goal is to have less than four active infections at any given point in time. And as you saw, we have 16, so a lot higher than what we would like. The reproduction rate of COVID um, across the state is 0.85, which is good. You want it to be less than one. 
Uh, we don't have the ability to see this at a local level, but I bet we're right at one, if not slightly above that. Um, given the fact that we do have um, a plateaued number of cases, we're not seeing a decline in our cases, but we're sitting pretty flat. So for every one individual that has COVID, they're giving it to about one other individual, hence the plateau. We're not going up, but we're not going down either. The testing positivity rate, so whenever we do testing across our county, what we would like to see is less than 5% of those tests come back positive. And what we are currently seeing is um, out of the last 47 tests that were done across our county, across all the clinics and hospital, from September 3rd to, to 9th, 17% came back as positive. So that is significantly higher than that 5% positivity rate. So we do wanna do a lot of testing, but have most of the tests come back negative. And then our last metric is those number of tests. What's our goal number of tests for us to be doing? And our goal is about 198 tests across the tri-county area. And last week we hit 170. We didn't have mobile testing coming through the area, so we were relying mainly on our clinics and our hospital testing across all three counties. So it got us up to 170. So almost at our goal, but not quite there. That's all. That's all I have. Oh, let me mention Sol Ross really quickly. I know I had mentioned that before. Um, so we do have about 16 active cases in Brewster County, and about half of those cases are coming out of uh, Sol Ross. And the way we're doing this, and we are going a little bit outside of what uh, DSHS wants us to, or what they're doing, what their policy is. For college students, the problem becomes that their permanent address is often not at the, at the university. Their permanent address is wherever their parents live. Um, although for every, for all intents and purposes, those students really live here. They live here, they grocery shop here, they eat at restaurants here. So when looking at an infection, even though um, DSHS reports those cases as being at their permanent residence and that whatever county that is, um, we feel that it makes sense to include those numbers in Brewster County numbers. So we are, our numbers are going to be a little bit off from what DSHS reports just because we feel it's much more practical to include those numbers in Brewster County metrics. Um, so mm -hmm. there is going to be a little bit of a discrepancy, but we do feel it's really important to, for, for the community to be, to be aware of, of these students and, and they're part of our community anyway. <laughs> Ekta, I know last call we talked a little bit about, um, you know, how do we get more testing, right? And I think when we look at the testing positivity rate and then, of course, the, the average Tri-County weekly testing where we're a little little bit below that 200 number a week. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we talked about that a little bit earlier on the CV team call this morning that um, the state is trying to maneuver or manage uh, the testing unit around. Um, on the DSHS call this evening, are you going to be able to speak to that a little bit more to try to uh, help bring in, you know, some more regular testing with the mobile units? Yeah, we've definitely been um, really pushing for the, them to come back um, and really stressing that we are a rural county and rural area in general, and we don't have a lot of that infrastructure built in or capability built in if the mobile testing does not come through. Um, the mobile testing has currently been uh, relegated to areas that are still showing very high numbers. And I know our numbers are really high, but there are a lot of counties that are struggling a little bit more than we are. Um, so they've been kind of relegated to help with mobile testing in those areas. We are looking to have them come back to us soon. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely speak to that on tonight's phone call with them. Yeah, because I think people feel very comfortable going to that mobile test unit as well. Um, so, you know, beyond just scheduling the, the appointment with the doctor, right? They know the testing is going to occur and they can show up and get it done. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Doctor, on the numbers that the DHS gives you uh, with the students at Soros, they're not counting, counting them as part of Brewster. It kind of gives folks a false sense uh, about how many cases we really have. And these folks are potential carriers. Shouldn't be excluding them from our, our area or any other area. You know, this is where they reside. 
uh, anywhere from three and a half months to, you know, to seven months a year. So is there any reason why they do that? Um, it's just to streamline and make sure that we are not counting somebody um, two times across the state. So if you think about all of the universities we have across the state and you know, if everybody counted them locally, but then they also got counted wherever their permanent residence is, that would make it really difficult. And especially right now, a lot of universities are offering online only classes more so than normal. So some of these kids are sitting at home in their permanent address and are not physically at the university. So even though they're enrolled at a university, they may not be there in person. And so it makes it really confusing. So they wanted to stick to one standardized way that they report these cases so that there's not any confusion and we're not counting anybody twice. Um, and I understand that, but I think for us, um, like I said, Brewster County, if you look at their dashboard, we're gonna have a lot less cases than 16 because they're not counting any Sol Ross student that's not a Brewster County resident in terms of their permanent residency. So I do think it's important for us to count them. Now, the only Sol Ross students we're not counting are any students that may not live in the county, for example, if it's a student in Marfa and they commute to Sol Ross for their classes and then leave. So their temporary address and their permanent address are both not in Brewster County. We're not counting them because again, they're not really spending time in our county very much. Um, so we're not counting them, but we are counting anybody who you know, they live in our dorms and, and or they live at home in a Brewster County residence with their family. Yeah, I, I, this is Rick. I, I would say just looking at the Brewster County website right now, they're reporting 17 because I had heard one today when I was down at the county offices. They're reporting 17 active cases. And even if you exclude the Saul Ross, which is half, I think, ACTA, we're still well above our four. So the, met, the metric still shows up red. To me, that's the real indicator. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Escobar, uh, this is Ramon. A, a question <clears throat> for comment and, and also a question to, um, for your professional opinion. Uh, I noticed that on the national news and also regional news, there's a hinting right now that people should consider uh, going in for the flu shots and or pneumonia shots, that this may be a, um, a good way of helping to build up the uh, immunological resistance to COVID as well. Um, <clears throat> I checked with my own personal provider. They said in a couple of weeks, they uh, will have vaccines in, so I'm, I'm going to prepare. What do you think about, do you think what is being recommended is useful that people should consider? Yes, I think so. So one of the, there's two things to consider. At this point, um, we have seen a lot of COVID in our community and we are not yet in the time of the year where we have a heavy viral respiratory season. We're, we're heading into that season. So you can just imagine how bad COVID can get when you superimpose just even regular colds, flus, a lot of other respiratory symptoms and respiratory infections on top of COVID. So um, the last thing we want is to head into a season and not take precautions, not give yourself layers of protection where you can. There's not a lot we can do in terms of vaccines for COVID, but there are things we can do for the other viral things that we see in the winter. So absolutely, of all the times to get your flu vaccine, we're definitely getting into a season that this is the time to really try to do it. Um, the other thing is that we have, the U.S. has not yet seen what we, what will happen if somebody gets, let's say, flu and COVID at the same time. What are your chances of coming out of that versus dying if you have a lot of infections, whoops, sorry, a lot of infections at the same time? Um, and so you want to give yourself any protection, you know, you can. And so I think it is going to be really important for, for um, individuals to do that. And you can get flu shots as soon as you're six months old and older. So um, I do think it's going to be really important. And then for um, our adults, I'm, I'm a pediatrician, but for adults, there's also the Pneumovax, the pneumonia vaccine. So if you qualify for that, um, that's definitely something to consider getting as well. 
Thank you. Yeah, doctor, can you comment where there's going to be sufficient room available in the Brewster County uh, area? So I can tell you, I've been here seven years now, and I can tell you we run out of flu shots in our clinic every winter. Um, some, some years we run out by Thanksgiving, some years we, you know, run out and then we, you know, we get sent some more and we run out again and get sent some more and we straggle along until maybe about January. But there has yet to be a single year where we make it through the entire winter with plenty of flu shots for everybody. Um, and that just happens on a regular year. I do think there's gonna be a rush for flu shots across the country and definitely across the world. Um, as we go through our flu season. And so I don't see us being able to make it through a flu season and not have shortages. I think um, all of our clinics are going to run out just like we do any year um, and probably sooner this year. I know all of the clinics we've been talking about it as, as physicians and we've all ordered extras and anticipated a slightly higher demand, but um, it, I do think we're going to run out. Yeah, because I understand that y'all place your order in December or January uh, for this time frame right now. Yes. Yeah, so as, as we're coming out of one flu season, we are already placing our order for the following year. So we look at the number of flu shots we give in one winter, and then we estimate how many we're going to need for the following year and place our order. And at least in our clinic, we've been increasing the number by 10% every year and every year we still run out. Now, there's also times that we order, let's say 300 doses, and we only get sent, you know, 200 or 250 just because that's what the manufacturer has. And so we don't always get our full order met either. Um, so there's a lot of logistical things that go into this in a normal year, in a normal flu season. And, and like I said, with the COVID pandemic, it's going to cause a lot more strain. So I fully expect that if you, I advise that if you are interested in getting your flu vaccine, then um, do it sooner rather than later. Thank you. Any more questions for the doctor? Okay, thank you very much, doctor. Very informative. Yep, yep thanks. Thank you. You've got two minutes to spare before your next meeting. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Hey, Gio, we hey. talk on the next slide. Um, so Mayor and City Council, I'm going to go through uh, the rest of the City Manager report, and then we've got, uh, as I shared earlier today, two, uh, two staff reports. Um, really wanted to focus today a lot on our goals and objectives. Um, you know, something that, you know, we started with in September of last year was a 180-day plan, and then in March, uh, we refreshed that uh, to really more of this initiatives, priorities, and challenges. Um, and, and broke that down, you know, across our different departments and disciplines here at the city. Um, you know, I worked back with our team on updating that. Uh, so as, as we come through September and into the fall season, uh, we'll uh, be going after these uh, initiatives and priorities. That being said, uh, post this meeting today, I'll work with GEO. Uh, really want to update on our city website, on the city manager page, a uh, reflection of that 180 day plan and then the March 2020, and then September 2020. Uh, that way folks can kind of see the progression um, and, and know uh, philosophically what we're working on uh, from a staff perspective. Um, you know, one of the other, I think, real key things, uh, and you can go down to the next slide, Geo, is, you know, our leadership training, um, the work that we're doing there uh, across uh, our department heads and our supervisors uh, to really uh, help them develop on their communication skills, uh, both with employees, um, as well as with uh, our citizens in the community and back with council and other elected officials. Uh, so th those are things that uh, I think our team is really embraced and super proud of, of the work they're doing there, uh, but it still is a priority of ours. Um, and, you know, when we think about, and I'm not going to go through and read all of these verbatim to you. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not one of, of reading every bullet point on a, on a, a PowerPoint, but I am going to hit uh, certainly the highlights. You know, community engagement uh, is, is very important from an administration perspective. I think the coffee with the city manager 
uh, has been well received by citizens. I think the chat with the chief uh, has been well received. Something uh, even that Scott Perry and I are talking about, you know, how do we start uh, doing things like tours of maybe our wastewater treatment plant uh, or tours of some of uh, our, our capture facilities. And that way, uh, citizens or elected officials who are interested, uh, we can continue to help engage uh, in, in the, the construction components of the city and, and how we run. So uh, certainly that community engagement will continue to be uh, a high threat. You know, layering down into finance, you know, Megan and I talk a lot about transparency. How do we get information out on the website? Uh, you know, once again, that's that whole communication theme, right? So how do we ensure not only that our council is aware, but our citizens are acutely aware of how we're spending money? Certainly this year, uh, when you think about all the work that's going on in the streets, it's more apparent <laughs> to people uh, on where their tax dollars are going. Uh, but we, we certainly take uh, a lot of, of interest in making sure that our citizens are aware of how we're spending money. Um, you know, one, one of the challenges that uh, certainly we've identified is uh, on the RFP side, you know, how clear and concise are we on the RFPs that we deliver uh, and how do we ensure that we're getting as many responses as possible? Because, you know, part of being where we're at in West Texas, right, we don't have is deep a pool of vendors. And so working back with all of our departments on how we perfect that and get the best pricing and the best quality of service uh, back for uh, city and the work that we're doing. Um, you know, thinking about grants, uh, Marcy, <coughs> oh, uh, thinking about grants, you know, Marcy Tuck uh, is a real superstar. Um, <laughs> I think one of the funny things is when you bring somebody in to work on grants and they start getting traction on it, then they, they take what's what's this part time position and, and then do we do we ladder that into something full time because of, of all the, the work and energy that we're doing. Uh, but I think, you know, effectively, when we talk about uh, what we're doing uh, relative to the CDBG relative to our parks and relative to our police. Uh, she's really zeroed in on that. The other thing that I like from a communication perspective is that she's working effectively back with the other governing entities, the school district. Uh, as well as many other, uh, to ensure we have their support uh, on the programs that, that we're working towards. So uh, next slide, please, Gio. Uh, Eric, we... Sure. Go ahead, Ramon. Uh, before moving on, I noticed, uh, first of all, congratulations on the initiative dealing with um, being a bit more transparent with uh, the public funds and how they're being used. Um, I think that's a tremendous uh, idea and to allow our residents to know where the funding and how much is being used to for improvements, for education, et cetera, for the benefit of our residents. Good job. Yes, thank you. Yeah, but super, super important. And thank you for pointing that out, Ramon. Um, you know, moving forward with our police and animal control, Chief Martin's uh, divisions, you know, a lot of what, uh, if you remember what he outlined in his 180 day plan uh, was really around training and development. Um, and I think the work that he and, and uh, Captain LaSoya are working on uh, through the leadership training um, and then some of our hires, when we think about how we develop our cases, uh, how we do our reporting, you know, all of that uh, has been part of that journey that he's been working through. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, too, he does the chat with the chief out there um, and really working on having a strong open door policy. Um, you know, some of the challenges, uh, certainly uh, with COVID, right? So we, we layered a different type of work on our police team, on our animal control, uh, whereas they're that first person in the field that's dealing with an individual, you know, how do we make sure that they are following good practice, setting a good example in the community. Uh, so that they'll continue to, to work through that. I think as Dr. Escobar talked about uh, through the fall, uh, as we think about healthcare practices through the community. Um, you know, animal control, Jennifer's been with us for a long time. Um, and I really think that she's stepping up her game. We saw that in her last presentation, uh, but really noodling heavy into the policies and procedures 
uh, and then the training, you know, how does she continue to, to develop that layer below uh, with her team? So I think part of, part of what we're doing from a leadership perspective is, is helping give, give her some of those tools uh, because once again, you know, animal control officer is out there in the field working with our citizens in the community uh, on, uh, on issues relative to pets uh, and animals. And so, you know, how we, we uh, work well and effectively with the community is super important. Um, next slide, please, Gio. Uh, thinking with our water, wastewater, sanitation, recycling, uh, that, that group or fund four, as we sometimes call them, uh, when Scott Perry joined the team. Uh, in fact, when I came back to the city, you know, the, the city had just made some, some major purchases for the wastewater treatment plant and that capital improvement uh, out there was, was certainly very important. Uh, I did a tour of the facility about a week and a half ago. Uh, really, really pleased with the work that uh, Mike Macias, Rich Wiley are doing out there. Um, and we've made some substantive improvements with our clarifiers, um, oxidation ditches, belt press, getting solids out. And we've still got to finish that aerator project. Uh, we should, uh, and Scott's going to report out on the October 6th meeting, but that's a big deal for us, if, if you remember. And so those capital projects will stay front and center. Uh, obviously, our SCADA improvements and what we're trying to do with our SCADA system that spans both water, wastewater, um, you know, is important. We've finally been able to get some testing going again with our employees so they can ladder up and get certifications. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, with our hires, how do we help them see this as a, as a longer term career and getting additional certifications helps them perform better uh, and helps us uh, retain them for, for longer periods of time. Um, of course, sanitation and recycling, um, you know, big, big trucks are a big question mark for me on our streets because the bigger the truck, the heavier they are, the more destruction they have on the work that Eddie and his teams are doing. Uh, so we've got to think through that uh, in our contractual uh, negotiations this next year. And also how we handle things like bulky trash pickup. We've got a lot of illegal dumping that still occurs. You know, how do we uh, put process and procedure in place to help eliminate that? Um, I think at our recycle plant uh, and the work that Adelina Bell is doing, uh, she's just been phenomenal. She's working on this great project um, uh, with... Saul Ross relative to Coconut Lodge, Poets Grove, how we reuse affluent water um, and how we really help uh, that area out there. So uh, very pleased with the, the proactive and positive work. And once again, you know, this is our team members creating these goals uh, and working back uh, with other uh, departments and other entities across uh, the city. Um, next slide, please, Gio. And then um, I, couldn't, I couldn't jam the gas one up on that utility slide. I thought it'd be too much of an eye chart, but um, you know, Randy, when he reported out a couple sessions ago with Scott and Johnny, you know, I think that real focus on what they're doing with leak surveys, uh, the capital, you know, once again, it's that capital improvement. Uh, how do we get more steel pipe out uh, and more of the poly pipe in? And then I think the other thing, you know, when we talk about communication, right, is that community awareness and something that our gas department's always done is had these kind of open houses when we get to the fall and they talk about 811, how do we talk about damage prevention, get a lot of handy people across the community that are putting in a fence, putting in a tree, and we don't want them to, to clip their gas line and create uh, some sort of challenge, a major safety issue. So, uh, those, uh, you know, as, as we move forward, those are our continued priorities for us. Um, I, I don't know if our capital uh, will ever go away, our capital expenditures along our utilities. Uh, but uh, once again, you know, we think about how we discuss and communicate that back with the, the community when they see the work that's being done, uh, that really resonates. Um, you know, moving forward to David Hale's team, what we're doing around uh, the building uh, and code enforcement. Um, obviously, David is a, is a pro uh, at his vocation. He really knows the codes. 
Um, and beyond that, you know, we talk about how do we best communicate with our constructors and our vendors in the community and ensure that uh, they understand what the ordinances are. And, and then when there are challenges, how do we work back with council uh, for updates on things? So, you know, an item would be like food trucks. You know, we're getting more and more food trucks wanting to come here. So he's, he's off working. Um, you know, how do we look at that from a city perspective? Uh, something for, for council to really delve into as well. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I, I think about our master plan for zoning. Uh, how do we lay out the city? If you look at it right now, it's somewhat uh, checkerboardish, And this is the big, big item uh, from a uh, planning and zoning perspective. Uh, but I, I believe that with David's leadership uh, and what we have on our planning zoning commission, uh, we can really start tackling that this fall. Um, and then of course, uh, on our code enforcement, uh, we've seen and had a lot of recent discussions relative to uh, the different primary codes out in the field, section 54, section 82 of our code of ordinances, uh, how we administrate that out in the field and think about accountability within the community and those impacts. Um, and so uh, part, of, uh, part of what we're trying to do too is communicate well back uh, so we've been working through some updates on our software and how do we get meaningful reports that come back to council so we can see how many different types of code violations we have over certain periods of time. Um, can we delineate those across, you know, the different wards of the city uh, if, if needed. So uh, that's part of the project work that, uh, you know, David and I are, are working through right now, uh, really software as a service. So. Um, next slide, please. Um, and when we move forward to Eddie's team, you know, our streets and parks, um, you know, of course, Eddie talked last meeting, their meeting before about, you know, how do we get over hundred blocks seal coated uh, and then some, uh, but the, you know, he's also PMing and working with uh, Lance Jarrett. And uh, although Lance is just a, a professional and he's really, really talented at getting things done. Uh, that combined with, with a lot of work that we're trying to do on the potholes. Uh, when I was taking the trash out this weekend, I did have a neighbor stop and say uh, how pleased he was as he goes through the city, he's a big walker, and um, you know how many streets are being completed. With that being said, we've got to keep that emphasis on it, and we certainly appreciate council support in this upcoming budget. Uh, because that will be uh, important for us to execute on, not only for the next six months as we prepare for the next paving season, but then uh, as we execute in 2021. Um, certainly, you know, I think about equipment, you know, breakdowns or slowdowns for Eddie. So how do we continue to make sure uh, the work that Ruben's doing to keep mm -hmm. our machines out there working, uh, but then we're replacing uh, equipment on, a, on an as needed basis. So. That's part of what uh, Eddie and I are working on and working back with Megan right now um, on, you know, how we best spend those dollars to ensure that we get a good, good product there. Uh, I'd like to comment on that uh, before you move on, uh, city manager. Uh, I think I, I shared this with you that a mayor commented on how well our streets look. And he wanted to know where we were getting funds from that I says, we're just being fiduciary responsible for this and we're covering more streets than ever. And also I received a compliment just the other day from uh, the father at the Greek Orthodox Church and a number of people that I've run into uh, since I've been back on how well the street and uh, Sunday I ran to some folks from uh, Arizona that flew in on, there's like 12 of them that fly in every year. And they also commented on how well our city looks with the streets, the alleys, and whatnot. So kudos to you and to Eddie and his crew and the Jared uh, uh, Construction Company for doing a fine job out there. Thank you, thank you. Really, really good team there and uh, certainly appreciate the work they're doing. So, so Eric, with the, uh, with the rain that we got and kind of the slowdown, uh, Eddie and, and uh, Lance may not get everything done is the strategy just roll those funds so the next year 
Uh, just trying to understand what the game plan is so we council can make sure we're supportive. Yes, so we will continue to pave um, into uh, the end of October, although the fiscal year will, will stop September 30th. Uh, we'll take a, a snapshot at that at the end of the year. We'll look backwards and see how much of what we committed in this fiscal year we spent. Um, anything that's below that uh, would certainly be, um, you, you know, additional money that we would still have in our fund balance. Yeah. And okay. then we'll manage through that this next year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We, we do want to pay to the end of October though. Um, we've got, um, you know, certainly Lance has just got those three blocks to tidy up and he's got another project to work on for us. Uh, but Eddie's got 25 blocks queued up right now that he's looking to seal coat and, Checking, I think there may be some, some weather tomorrow, but hopefully we'll get back on track before the end of the week. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, and, and, and then on park side, um, you, you know, really good staff there. I think the master parks plan uh, really outlined a lot of what we think about from a capital perspective. Marcy's out um, chasing those dollars for us. But then I think internally, the work that Robert Giannis is doing with his staff, keeping them uh, out there working on proactive projects, uh, even when it rains. So I think uh, that's that's an important thing. You know, one of the other pieces that you know Robert's really working on is the the irrigation competency within his staff. So he's got some good players, but you know we need to do some additional training there. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, finally, you know, we think about our our airport. Uh, we've talked quite extensively recently about the two main projects, the Seal Co. Um, as, as well as the lighting project and the AWOS that uh, we need to get done as well. That's uh, already up on TxDOT's uh, priority plan. You know, these are, are uh, we'll continue to, to petition back for the state to get those 9010 funds and uh, remediate some of that aging infrastructure. Uh, but I think more importantly, how do we, how do we really start attracting uh, more people to land and buy fuel from us. And so that's work in front of us. Uh, we, we are, uh, got an employee there who's close to retirement and, you know, how do we actively, uh, find a new supervisor that can drive some of the needs, uh, for the future. So Scott and I are actively working on that right now. Um, tourism visitor center, uh, super pleased with the work that Chris and Heather are doing. Um, I think, the you know all of the safety elements relative to coronavirus and then how do you layer that back into event planning uh you know and preparing for events uh whether it's a pandemic or a non-pandemic in context uh, very very pleased with the work they're doing there one of the things that we've noticed has popped up um, is continued uh short-term rental properties and so how do we go back through and relook at those and make sure those folks are signing up, uh, paying their hotel occupancy tax and realizing the benefits of all the promotion and advertising and marketing that we're doing. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, our municipal court, I think, uh, you know, a lot of what uh, we've certainly had with Lorena this year is that training and development. Um, uh, and then how do you, work the cases through the system, make sure we, we clear out old case files. Uh, we've seen a little bump and a rise. And so I know she's identified as making sure we don't want to get back into uh, having longer uh, period uh, or a higher volume of, of uh, older case files. Uh, and then certainly, you know, how we work on our relationships uh, back with all of the different entities that uh, support the municipal court and interact with the municipal court. Uh, she is, Lorena is part-time uh, as an employee. You know, at one point we did have a full-time employee over there, uh, but she does balance between being part-time there and uh, part-time human resources. So uh, I think as we work through some of our spatial uh, changes that, that are on our roadmap uh, with spacing employees out, um, we'll be able to bring back the municipal judge as well as the court clerk to City Hall. And that will help uh, some, some of the efficiency that she needs as well. So uh, very excited about that. 
Any questions on the initiatives, priorities, challenges? Uh, yes, Eric, I have a, uh, a suggestion for maybe the next 180 days or, or future uh, initiative plans. As we look at the airport, as again, to, to sort of try to come up with some sort of strategic or long-term uh, plan effort as to where we want the airport to be in, let's say, 10 years or 20 years, and what services it can help to provide for the interest of all residents of, of Alpine. Um, just something to consider. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I think uh, it's good, um, good topic of discussion for our Airport Advisory Board as well, who's getting back and meeting and, and talking about that. We've got a good active board out there as well. So thank you. Good. Any other questions on that? Uh, otherwise, we'll jump down to slide 15. All right. Without any further ado, a uh, new event. I know we hinted at it last uh, meeting, the Midweek Music and Mercan Mercantile event, Wednesday evenings. Uh, it'll be an outdoor type event um, where we allow for selling of goods uh, as well as a uh, food truck uh, closed down third street uh, have some music out there and uh, a lot of other communities across the u.s are doing these types of events um, it, it's a way of thinking through helping some of your businesses drive more commerce but do it in you know more safe and friendly ways um, and Heather is a great event planner and organizer. And when we gave her this idea, she ran with it. Uh, if you look down to the next slide for me, Geo, we'll see a just kind of a general layout, uh, closing Third Street, uh, having music uh, at the, the visitor center. But then we've already got, you know, three food trucks right adjacent to that, but inviting other food trucks in that want to participate as well as um, allowing, you know, vendors, tables, things like that uh, to come in. And we'll uh, run this uh, target first date is September 30th, and then see how it goes uh, into uh, late October, early November. And we anticipate we'll, we'll have good response from this. Excited about it. And on the city manager side, that's all I have. If there's any questions for me, uh, I'd be glad to answer. Otherwise, we'll jump down to Stephanie's report. Can you hear me? Yep. I hear you, Stephanie. Hi. <laughs> um, Gio, you can skip to that one. Um, this is just more for your information so you can see what our um, utility connections and usage is for the past four months. Um, you can see September's not in there because our billing cycle is a month behind, so September is not over with. Um, gas versus water, you could see um, the, the connections on both looks like we're dropping a little bit, but consumption on water has gone up. Um, as we see the colder months, we'll see the gas consumption go back up as well. Um, you can go to the next slide, Geo. Um, these are our current projects that we're working on in the utility billing. Um, first and foremost, we are working on account audits. I know Megan has spoken briefly about this. Um, it's a big deal. We're going through each and every account to make sure that they are up to utility ordinance. As far as the active accounts, they're being billed within city limits, gas, or sorry, excuse me, water, garbage, sewer. Um, we are verifying if we come across an active account that's not being billed according to ordinance. Um, we are sending a field technician out there to verify why, why are they not getting billed water? Why are they not getting billed sewer? Um, Andy, I know you're familiar with this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have a few uh, customers that um, do have wells still and some that do have septic. We just want to verify and document each one of those for the auditors. 
Um, also, if they are outside city limits, we want to make sure we put them as such because their their rates are a little higher than inside city limits. Um, disconnections for non-payment. So we're coming back from COVID. We did um, we didn't disconnect people during this pandemic, um, but we are coming back from it. We have a few people that have been a little behind. So we do have payment plans in place for those that are affected by COVID who have rather high bills that they're just trying to, you know, keep up. Um, this has actually been working out really well. Um, I did run reports today and most people that we have on payment plans, they're making their regular payment. Um, they're just grateful that we're cutting them a break. <laughs> Um, so most of them have already paid off their their accounts and they are current and up to date. So um, you can see over here, I know Eric has showed you this chart. This is our, um, this is what we're going to be doing for the next several months until January. So we're in September, we will be doing disconnections for three months. Um, who, people who are three months behind. Um, and then starting in October, it will be two months, two months, and then um, in January, we will go back to the one month disconnections. Um, we're also working with Purdue to collect on delinquent water and gas inactive accounts with balances. Um, Gio, can you go to the next slide, please? So when the water adopted the assist software that the gas was using um, it, the conversion was not clean and left false inactive accounts with balances. So we, during the um, in-house auditing, we are looking at those inactive accounts as well. We're going through each and every one of them. There's probably about 5,000 accounts total. So this will take some time to go through all of them. Um, as we're going through them, we can set the cycle to um, an actual in inactive account with a balance to make a cleaner list so that we can transfer that over to Purdue, who will attempt to collect on these debts. Any questions? Can go to the next one, please. Um, these are some of our completed projects. We do have the DocuSign e-signature um, utility forms up and running on our website. Um, the customer can actually fill out, you can see like a, an example right here, um, can fill out the forms online, which will directly email the utility clerks. And once we complete it, um, it will send a copy to the customer. So both parties involved have copies of all signed forms, um, which, is, which is a big deal. Um, less paperwork also. Um, so that's, that's exciting. Yeah, um, good work on that. Good work they, on that, Yeah, um, uh, Geo deserves props for this one because we, we did <laughs> take some courses together to figure out how to get this up online and he's he's been a huge help yeah. um, I thought it was interesting that within two hours of you going live you had your first application completed so right yeah as soon as we got it up we started getting people filling out these forms which is great um, like I said less paperwork um, not not so much uh, human contact <laughs> yeah. um, but I think it gives a good paper trail too and, and those are things that that customers are looking for, you know, when they come sign up for services, then we have an accurate record of, of when they signed up. So thank Correct. you for working with Gio on that. Oh, you're welcome. Also, the DocuSign is um, really great because we do have a few customers that kind of skip over a few things and don't sign a couple of pages. And this actually makes them fill it out before it, it sends it to us. So everything is completed before it gets to us. Um, also completed projects, uh, the cash handling training, um, Megan and Grizel, accounts receivable, have provided written and oral cash handling that says handing, but 
that's okay. <laughs> uh, and cash verification, tra uh, cash verification training for the customer service clerks. So all three of us have been trained and up to date with the new finance um, cash handling training. Excuse me. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you go to this next one, please? Thank you. Um, these are our departmental goals. Um, we are working on cross training. Um, Susan, who is now in our water department, she will be eventually switching over to the gas so she can be more familiar with how the gas side of things work. Um, and Diana will be moving back to water so she can get that refreshment on the water side. Um, we're, I'm also going to be, excuse me, training the customer service clerks additional duties and daily tasks to allow for advancement in their positions. So a lot of what I do, um, I am going to be creating templates and guidelines for each duty and task that I perform so that these girls can learn um, and for future customer service clerks um, can learn um, very detailed instructions on what it is exactly that I do <laughs> in case, you know, I get hit by a car tomorrow. <laughs> um, um, Oh, excuse, oh, excuse me. me. I got to edit. Um, um, anyway, anyway, so, so working, working on those, those uh, uh, with customer 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 customer. Um, um, our, our third, third goal, goal is, is on the utility ordinance, starting, starting with the owner's responsibility for the renting. What happens a lot of times is renting will we'll out, 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 out um, closing, closing their account. Account. so it just hey, Stephanie you got you got some really bad feedback yeah I have a huge echo going Eric on. was actually the police chief I muted him okay okay <laughs> can you hear me now yeah we can hear that you now. better Perfect. sorry that was really distracting um so yes uh on the rentees that um rent a lot of it is so Ross students um they they don't know the proper procedures to close out an account so most of the time they'll just skip town and we in the office do not know or you know we don't know when they do this so their bills just continue to rack up um right now it is the responsibly the responsible party is the uh, the account holder however that's been proven to <laughs> not work out so much <laughs> so um we want to make it to where at least the property owner comes in and informs us that these people are no longer living here we want to close this account so that the, these bills don't continue to to rack up perfect and that's Thank it you, Steph. you're welcome Good job, <coughs> Stephanie. Yes. All right. Good. Next slide, Chief. We're gonna have to pull you off mute. You gotta make sure you only got one. There we go. There we go. Everybody hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm presenting the, the fire report from January through August today. Um, there was a total of 19 fire calls total. Six were in the city, 13 were in the county. Uh, I reached out to Mr. Scudder, to Chief Scudder, and uh, could not get a hold of him, so I am trying to do the best I can with the information that was provided to me. Uh, I did talk to one of the volunteer firefighters and they do, uh, they have had meetings every Wednesday. The, win the meetings start at uh, 6 p.m. And uh, we, uh, I can't see my list here because there's something on my screen. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, 
we've reached out to the fire department to get an asset list of identifying any any properties that they are any items they need to have replaced or repaired. Um, still waiting on that. Uh, the last fire uh, department, the uh, quarterly meeting showed them to have 20 volunteer firefighters. And uh, I'm sure if uh, anyone in the community would be interested in being a firefighter, volunteer firefighter, to be sure and reach out to uh, Chief Scudder with the fire department. And uh, I'm sure he would welcome that. Uh, to touch on uh, Lieutenant Fierro, he is currently uh, in the process of getting his fire inspector certification. And it's projected that sometime in November, mid-November is when he should be completed with that. I know a lot of the, the schooling that he has needed has push, been pushed back due to COVID. Uh, so he is continuing to work on that. Uh, he will need to travel to a town over by Dallas to do like a three days hands-on training. Uh, once he gets to that point, but he is working on it. And that's all I have. Any questions? Question, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, no, I had said, go ahead. Have any. Uh, so that, that's it for the uh, city manager staff reports this evening, Mayor. Okay, very good. Okay, did David Hale ever come on? Uh, yes, we, uh, I sent out that note earlier today. We're, uh, we're pushing that till uh, the October 6th meeting. Okay. Okay, let's move on to public hearings. We have none and we'll move to the consent agenda. Minutes, financial reports, uh, department written reports, board appointments, etc. Notice to the public, the following items are of routine administrative nature been furnished with background and support material on each item and or it has been discussed at a previous meeting. Items will be acted upon by one vote without being discussed separately unless requested by a council member, in which event the item or items will immediately be withdrawn from individual consideration in its normal sequence after the items not requiring discussion have been acted upon. The remaining items will be adopted by one vote. City Manager. Yes, Honorable Mayor and City Council, we have two items this evening. The first one is under my name. It's the approval of the minutes from the City Council meeting on September 1st, 2020. And the second item on the consent agenda is under Councilor Stevens' name. It's the approval of Bibina, uh, Bibiana, I'm sorry, Bibi Gutierrez for the Parks Board at large for Ward 5. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. <laughs> okay, who's second? Second. second. Okay, Olivas. Ramon, Ramon seconded. <laughs> okay, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, see those. And all those uh, against, like sign. Motion carries. Thank you all very much. We'll move on to item eight information or discussion items, sharing in discussion actions, uh, strategies, focus on updating the city uh, lighting ordinance that takes account improvements in technology and consideration of dark sky initiatives. Councilman Stevens. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, uh, Gio, if you could bring uh, Laura Gold off, let me give a, a short introduction. Uh, as you're aware, technology continues to advance over time. Uh, and as a result of that, it provides an opportunity for the city to consider any updates to our existing lighting ordinance to improve the dark, dark skies that we so much value uh, in the Big Bend uh, area and uh, in West Texas. Uh, I received a, uh, an email from Laura on the 21st of August uh, and uh, entered a discussion with her. We've had a number of discussions back and forth. Uh, I thought it worthwhile to bring uh, her to council to walk through a few slides to, in essence, give, bring council up to speed on uh, the items we have talked about. She's going to end with a recommendation of uh, three items 
of, of uh, one of which is that the city sponsor a, a community workshop for sharing proposed changes, get feedback and potential impacts and make recommendations. And based upon that number two, that uh, there be any a revision to the proposed ordinance for comments and recommendations. And then that we follow the uh, city process for any proposed changes uh, for lighting. Uh, this thing uh, has the potential for having a wide range of impact. I personally think it's the right thing to go do. There are some challenges to go work. so. With that, let me turn it over to Laura and uh, let you walk through the slides, Laura. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's a, Good evening, Laura. It's a pleasure to uh, be here with you. Um, Gio, can you go to the next slide? This is a view of Alpine. And um, can you see my mouse moving around on this? No? OK. Nope. So there's, to the left, the picture on the left um, and the picture on the right, the, the one on the right is just labeled, but it's dim. I mean, you can see like the sky is milky right above Alpine. That's the light glow from Alpine. Okay. I just wanted you to see that because it's, it's, very, it's very visible, very visible. So anyway, next slide. Um, 1997 compared to 2014, you can see the encroachment from um, the surrounding area. You can see the growth of the, the uh, glow of Alpine. And um, it's, it's, um, it's, there's things that we can do about that. But so we need to work together. We need to figure this out. Alpine is a great location. A lot of people have come here. They, you know, they hear about where we have dark skies and the town has a um, dark sky ordinance and lighting, a lighting plan. And so let's really make that happen because it's a really neat place to live. Yeah, Laura. I yes, sir. Question. Uh, the lighting at Coconut Field. I mean, those things you can see for a mile. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, those should be on a timer and not on at all when they're not being used. I think the ordinance currently says that it's one hour after the end of an event. Have you done about that? Or oh, I think so, 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 so maybe that's something we need to go work and we need to make yes. sure everyone's compliant with the current ordinance because as you would point out, we don't always do a good job of that, whether it's at uh, Coconut or whether it's at the football field for uh, Saul Ross. So I think there's mm -hmm. some work to do. I think there's a great opportunity to bring up awareness and we're gonna get into that dialogue. Right. Absolutely, that's, thank you, Rick. Yes, yes, that's the purpose of the workshop. Next slide, please. Okay, pretty much this is what Rick was, was mentioning. You know, we, we um, the city of Alpine we approved um, applying for a dark sky status in 2009. Now, I don't know how many of you folks on the council were on the council back in 2009. So maybe there's some historical information that would be, uh, uh, would come out of a workshop. And so it goes back quite a ways. So the tech, and, and since 2009, of course, technology has continued to evolve and um, making, um, LED lights, very affordable, making them portable, making that you can use them anywhere. They're very adaptable. Um, but the existing ordin ordinance now, it, it needs work. I'll just leave it at that. It needs a lot of work. And um, so that's the purpose of holding a workshop to get all the interested parties together and to discuss how this is going to affect or how it can affect and how to make it a really good ordinance that works. The proposed ordinance, if you sit it side by side with the existing ordinance, you, if you have that chance, you, you will see the night and day difference between the two of them. I mean, to me, to me, anyway. So I hope we do have a workshop. Can I see the next slide, please? Yeah, the key objectives. You can see this, reduce and eliminate glare and improve nighttime visibility and encourage efficient controlled lighting that conserves energy. 
make the community a better place to live and work. Absolutely, more inviting. Uh, protect your neighbors and properties from light trespass. Preserve our heritage of a clear, dark, and starry night sky. Be mindful of the needs of the McDonald Observatory and position the city to apply for a designation of an international dark sky community. Next slide, please. So we're gonna hold a community workshop. That's the plan and with the intent of reviewing the existing and the proposed changes and understand why the ordinance needs to be updated. Um, we, we, want, we want feedback on the potential impacts and we want to make recommendations. We want feedback so that we can explain and understand the, feed, the uh, impacts and address them. We want participation. I want to distribute a draft and revised of the revised proposed ordinances for comments after that and recommendations and we're going to follow the city process for review and approval of, of ordinance changes which includes presentation at city council public hearings regarding the changes and a vote by council. So I don't know how we're gonna schedule that. That's, uh, I, can, I, I guess we'll have another discussion. Mr. I, I can answer that, Laura. Sure. <laughs> I'll get with you and get a few proposed dates. Awesome. For you and the team. Okay, and we'll work on a guest list. Yep, and then we'll work on the guest list. I think, I think we should use the Civic Center. Well, we've got 8,000 right. square feet in there and we can spread out and. Okay. Uh, I know uh, in talking to Bill Wren and seeing, you know, some of the, like when he presented to the uh, independent school district, he brought in some examples of, of uh, different types of fixtures and things. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's get a good guest list, get a good agenda together. Normally, if we hold these to about two hours, um, th that, that holds people's attention span. Beyond that, it gets a little long. Okay. Sounds good. And if, if we've got to schedule another one after that, that you know, that's okay too, but uh, yeah. just get with me and we'll, we'll work on that. Yeah, yeah. I found that uh, when people start getting information, they have a lot of questions and then you, it takes a little bit of back and forth after that. Yeah, and I think if we put the, uh, the notes from the meeting up on the website as well to allow people who weren't able to attend, uh, we'll, we'll uh, videotape the whole thing as well and, um, and get, you know, kind of have that open period of time, 30 days or whatever, where people can, you know, engage with either BBCA or you or me and ask questions or their council members. Okay. Perfect. Sounds good. Awesome. Very, very good. Next. I have awesome. a question for Laura. Sure. Uh, do you have any idea how the Alpine, the present lighting in Alpine may be impacting or affecting the nighttime viewing and research that's conducted at McDonald's Observatory? There's a lot of glow. That's why, that for, that's why I showed that first picture because you can see the light dome over Alpine and it, 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 it does distribute a lot, it scatters a lot of light up into the sky. That's a really good question. And I think when uh, we have the workshop, Bill will be able to give you a very good quantitative type of answer. Okay. One thing to possibly bring it up at the workshop is if uh, McDonald's Observatory can help out via grants from whatever sources they get their grants from to help mm -hmm. the city of Alpine make the required changes if needed in the future. Yes, money money is on my agenda. It's to find, find money. It's on my agenda too. Yes, indeed. Okay, so this, I wanted to show you guys to see this. I don't bank here at this bank, but this is a great example of well done outdoor lighting on a commercial facility. They've got a really, you know, they've got a full cut off uh, parking lot light in the back left cor corner. And a in, in none, of the, none of the bulbs that they're using on the front of the building or in the parking lots or the curbs, none of the bulbs are exposed. They're all hidden so that you don't have any glare. You have nice, very nice lighting. So this is just a, a good example of a well done outdoor lighting plan on a commercial property in town. So take a, take a look at it. Admire it when you go by at nighttime. Okay, next slide, please. Texas, see that little pocket on the left where Brewster County is where we are? It's gonna shrink. This is in 2014, this is six years ago. 
So yeah, we have reason to work on our lighting plan and really support the dark sky initiatives and the industries and all the businesses that um, want to make astro tourism and eco tourism part of our repertoire. What, what is Alpine known for? What is the, you know, we're not just a pit stop on the highway. We're special. Okay. I don't have anything else, folks. Thank you very much. Laura, thank you. And thanks for, uh, and uh, clearly you and Eric got some things to work and I'll continue to be engaged and we look forward to this dialogue. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, Mayor, back to you. You can unmute, Mayor. We got to unmute you. There we go. Laura, you still there? Yep. Okay. How much of an impact is the petroleum industry north of Jeff Davis and Brewster County still uh, having on the, the lighting as far as the observatory is concerned? Um, it's significant. It's quite significant. Um, could I ask Bill Wren to answer that question. I see him in the crowd. Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. Gio, can you unmute Bill? Yes, I'm working on it. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hello, everybody. Hello, Mr. Wren. How are you doing? Uh, doing good. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've been keeping track of the uh, uh, the light uh, coming from the Permian Basin, um, oil and gas related activities now since, um, but we've been measuring, we've been quantifying it since 2015. And we've seen uh, a significant increase down low on the horizon. Fortunately, we're far enough away uh, from, you know, the, the main, the closest oil fields are in Reeves County. And so what we see is a glow down low to the horizon uh, that has been increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing with the ebb and flow uh, in the oil and gas uh, uh, industry. And by the way, it's not just oil and gas specific. It's also all of the uh, commerce that comes along with it, the new housing and chain stores and restaurants and what have you that all contributes to what we see. But uh, the glow actually is not interfering significantly with our ability to conduct research. It is concentrated down low to the horizon in the direction of the Permian Basin and does not extend above 30 degrees above our horizon uh, in that direction. We're primarily interested in studying objects in the sky that are much higher overhead. We're not using these big telescopes to look down into the trees along the horizon. So as of yet, it's not significantly impacting our ability to do research. Great. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay, very good. And let's go ahead and move on to the item two, city manager. Yeah, Honorable Mayor and City Council, item two is the information discussion on issues the city of Alpine is encountering with Brewster County. The discussion, the discussion will also include the magistration process related to the county accepting arrested individuals by Alpine Police Department. Uh, I had shared uh, with council a couple weeks ago, uh, a meeting request that our district attorney, Sandy Wilson, had sent out to the sheriff, uh, the judge, uh, police chief, and myself. Uh, council asked that we get um, feedback from that. So I've invited uh, Sandy Wilson to um, attend the meeting and give us feedback on that this evening. Um, she did ask that, uh, you know, we do, um, you know, let her go through, limit the discussion or the questions until the end. Mm -hmm. And there, because it is an open investigation, on certain items, there will be limited things that she can answer. Uh, Geo, if you can hold Sandy. 
off of mute. She's ready. Okay. I'm ready. Are you, can y'all hear me? Yes. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sandy Wilson. I'm the 83rd district uh, attorney out here in this area. And I'm here to address these ongoing issues between the Alpine Police Department and the Brewster County Sheriff's Department regarding uh, refusal of the Sheriff's Department to allow the police officers to put uh, arrested individuals in jail prior to magistration. I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna do a quick background just to kind of give you an idea of where we're at. Uh, as far back as I can remember, and I'm a local from Marathon, uh, the Brewster County Sheriff's Office, Alpine Police Department, uh, and Saul Ross have always worked well together. The officers have always worked well uh, out in the city doing, especially in the, the limits of the city, doing, uh, helping each other, assisting with arrest and, and certain calls and stuff like that. Uh, and since the agencies are so small, it's very inherent that they work together in this area because, the, because um, they've got to ensure a safe environment for everywhere, everyone. And the standard of practice for all law enforcement agencies, whether you're DPS, city, sheriff, whatever, is to admit an arrested individual into jail prior to magistration. That's always happened. The underlying rationale behind this is to get the officer back out on patrol, and it's perfectly legal for the jail to accept these individuals prior to magistration. Now, I wanna, I wanna talk briefly about the magistrates. One of the many jobs of the magistrates that we have, we have some that are elected officials, such as justice of the peace officers. We have some that are appointed by the city, such as the city judge. They're along, um, among their many uh, um, uh, uh, duties they have is the duty to magistrate an individual after arrest. And they do this by informing them of the charge, uh, uh, admonishing them to their rights, like the right to remain silent, and especially to the right to have counsel during any criminal proceeding. They also will assist, some uh, magistrates can assist in obtaining um, counsel for an individual if he's indigent. They also uh, are set responsible for setting bail for these individuals, as well as any type of conditions that might go along with the type of crime there and the level of the crime that they're being charged with. And it's important to note, the magistrates have a 24 to 48 hour window in which they're obligated to magistrate an arrested individual. So this present issue is not a magistration issue as long as they stay within that, that time frame. And during my investigation, I got a lot of um, feedback that that was the issue was the magistrate, it's not. Uh, the issue kind of started, uh, as y'all recall, in November 2019, Robert Martin was appointed as the new chief of the city uh, police department. When he was appointed, he was currently working for Brewster County Sheriff's Department as the deputy and the court bailer for the district court. And uh, shortly after his hiring, uh, the Alpine officers began um, having increasing difficulty communicating with the Brewster County Sheriff's deputies when they requested assistance. And then come... Uh, Fast forward to March 2020, Brewster County Sheriff's Department abruptly began refusing admission of arrestees into the county jail unless they were first magistrated. And it's important to note that no other law enforcement agency out here has been required to magistrate their arrested individuals prior to admission into the Brewster County Jail. Only Alpine Police Department was affected. Then after this policy took effect, the deputies began to refuse to assist Alpine police officers at all. And they have a certain encryption on their radios that they can, um, that they can initiate that uh, c prevents communication between the Alpine police officers and the Sheriff's Department. Now, after years of everybody doing well with this, this abrupt change is kind of concerning. Um, and then about this time, um, the local magistrates begin to refuse to magistrate at night because uh, they're, you know, they sleep at night. So, and they, their, their time that they didn't want to magistrate was between 10 p.m. and 7 to 8 a.m. the next morning. And this forced the, the Alpine Police Department officers then to be pulled off the streets and away from calls when they arrest an individual so that they can uh, sit with the individual until a magistrate is available. And uh, neither Alpine PD or the city of Alpine has ever had any type of holding cells because they're always able to put their, these uh, individuals in jail immediately after their arrest. 
And then in addition, another issue is once the individual is magistrated, the officer and the individual are forced to wait outside the jail because as of March, um, Alpine police officers are no longer able to go into the jail at all, which means that Sally Port, that little area that raises up where they can go in with their car and close it to ensure that the uh, person arrested doesn't escape, they no longer have access to that. They have to wait outside with this individual after magistration until a jailer comes in and takes the individual. Then they further have to wait um, after that until they return with their handcuffs. Only then can the officer return to duty. And this is leaving the streets in the city of Alpine with almost no officers to patrol or take calls. <clears throat> the only other option for the police department at this time is to release the individuals back into the community and arrest them later once your magistrate signed the warrant. This is not only a big safety issue for citizens in Alpine, but it's certainly going to be a big liability issue for the city of Alpine should someone be injured or hurt if they have to release these individuals back out into the community. And uh, to add further injury, on August 4th of this year, Saul Ross uh, University Police Dispatch was immediately relocated from the Alpine Police Department to the Brewster County Sheriff's Dispatch. And this happened literally overnight. No notice, no anything to the city, no notice to anybody. And, um, and prior to this, they had been in the Alpine Police Department for years, as, as far as I know, for a long time. And they, what they do is they did is they shared the same phone system. So if a person call for either the Alpine PD or Saul Ross, which they're all in the city limits, their call was handled immediately. Um, however, now that they've um, moved over to the sheriff's department, it's a different phone system. So, and without giving notice to anybody, it's kind of made it difficult. You're going to have a situation where someone's going to call uh, needing to talk to a Saul Ross officer where they always call at the police department and have to be told to hang up their phone and call the sheriff's department uh, because th there's no connection between the lines. In addition, now after, after the Saul Ross officers were removed, uh, were moved over there, their radios have now become encrypted where they're not able to communicate with the Alpine Police Department. And this move has effectively crippled the Alpine Police Department from performing their duties to police and ensure the safety of the residents of Alpine. Also of concern is welfare of the police officers, both Alpine police officers, Brewster County deputies, and Saul Ross patrol officers who no longer have communication to be able to back each other in a severe emergency situation. And uh, I, I, looked through, I looked over this, I asked questions, I investigated through this case for a couple of weeks. Both the city of Alpine and the chief of police have reached out to the Brewster County Sheriff's Office and the sheriff oh. Uh, several times to resolve this issue and they have received no response at all from the Brewster County or the Sheriff. And, uh, and, and a following example is of some things that are probably going to be happening here because we had an incident August 8th right after they were removed. An Alpine officer arrested an individual during the night and he took him to the police station because there was nowhere else to keep him and he put him in his office and when he stepped into the adjacent office to grab a form, this individual takes off running, goes through the, the, the police station door out into the street while he's fully handcuffed. Now, fortunately, the officer was able to uh, go catch this guy and nobody got injured, neither the, the person or the officer, any citizen. Um, but the officer had no one to call for assistance either. And um, this gave this individual a felony charge, which they shouldn't have had to have if the, if the, if the officer had been allowed to go ahead and admit them prior to um, magistration at night. Once I was made aware of the escape, it became clear to my office that the city attorney was not adequately addressing this issue. And I am, a lot of people don't know this, but I'm the chief law enforcement officer out here. So I stepped in at that point and sent a letter to the city, to the county judge, and the sheriff requesting an immediate hearing to stop to address this issue. And I also requested the sheriff to immediately stop this policy until we could meet and work out a safer resolution. The sheriff neither acknowledged my request, nor did he come to the meeting, nor did he send any representative to this meeting, which I think is very important meeting. Um, this, <clears throat> this, um, this continued refusal by the sheriff, the BCSO and the sheriff 
to meet with the city for a rapid resolution, not only a safety issue for citizens of Alpine and the county, but a safety issue for our local officers. They live here, they work here, many of them are raised here, and I, it's just not fair to our community. And my office, for one, is not going to tolerate bullying, illegal and deceptive acts by one law enforcement agency against another to the point of not allowing that agency to perform its law enforcement duties. No law enforcement agency gets to abuse its office by obstructing and retaliating against another agency ever. And because I've received no response, I have reached out to the attorney general's office. I've spoke to an attorney over there. I have sent them a detailed letter uh, detailing all of the issues here between the city and the sheriff's department. I uh, sent it along with supporting documents and text messages made by the sheriff. I have asked for immediate assistance before anyone gets hurt or killed because it's not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. And this is a serious issue that I believe needs to be addressed immediately. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. Sandy, this is yes, the sir. mayor. Did you go, uh, talk to Rod Ponton, the city attorney on this issue? I did not talk to Rod Ponton on this issue because he had already been uh, communicating with the sheriff and sending, uh, addressing this issue back as it not being an issue uh, with uh, the sheriff, but more with the city. They, uh, he addressed this issue as being a magistrative issue. It is not a magistrative issue. It is an issue of one agency refusing another agency to perform their duties. That's what this is. Okay, so it's only one department that's having that issue? Yes, DPS can admit, um, HSI, any of these other law enforcement agencies are able to continue the way it's always been, where you put them in prior to magistration, especially at night, because these officers, we're limited to how many officers we have out on the street, whether it's Brewster County Sheriff, whether it's Alpine PD, or whether it's Sol Ross. And these officers need to be getting back out on the street. And they're not being allowed to do that. And it was an abrupt change from since March of this year. Okay. And you say you've come, you try to reach out to the Sheriff's Department on this and so has uh, Chief Martin? That is correct. Okay. We have reached and out. And documented somewhere that y'all have reached out to them? Yes, it is documented. And uh, okay. Judge Cano is the one that responded on behalf of okay. Sheriff Dotson and told me in one email that it would be, uh, he would be on standby. He got notice, so I emailed him at a second email address and personally requested that he come and address this issue and he has refused to this date. Any questions for Sandy? I'm sorry, who was the one that had suggested for you to bring this up? I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out as to why Rod wasn't involved in this from the very beginning and who went to Sandy to start this? Oh, I can answer that question. Uh, there was an email, uh, a, a memo sent out by Rod in, uh, uh, in June where he addressed the issue as being a, a, a magistrative issue and that if the sheriff was indeed um, doing this against the city, then that was wrong. Other than that, there, um, he has reached out. He has actually met with the sheriff and with a county attorney at his office, and he is uh, pretty much laying the blame on the fact that the magistrates are the ones at fault here. And the magistrates are not at fault. When I learned about that escape on August 8th, and the fact that that individual now has a felony charge, that's when I got involved, because it's obvious to me that uh, Mr. Ponton is, is not able to handle this situation. Any more questions? Rod does. He's muted though. Hello? Yeah, can you all hear me now? We yep. can hear you. Yes. Yeah, I've never heard from uh, Ms. Wilson regarding this issue. Uh, I have not blamed the magistrates on the issue. The issue obviously is an issue between the sheriff's office and the police department. The magistrates have said that they're willing to magistrate uh, persons arrested, but they don't want to do it in the middle of the night. And so uh, that's the, the way the issue has been laid out. Um, when I met with the sheriff, the sheriff explained to me that his reluctance to uh, accept police department cases for to go into the jail 
before the magistration was because he was afraid of his civil liability if a person was arrested without probable cause. And that if a magistrate determined that there was a lawful arrest, he was happy to take that person into jail because then he would be protected from civil liability. And I've sent a memo to the council mm -hmm. regarding that. So it's not that I'm unable to deal with this. As city attorney, it's not my job to, uh, to magistrate people. And it's not my job to, to uh, follow the magistration process. That's a process that goes between the law enforcement agencies and the uh, magistrates. The magistrates in this regard are Bob Steele, the Justice of the Peace, and Sandy Stewart, the, uh, the Alpine City Magistrate. Uh, Ms. Wilson, have you talked to Mr. Steele or Ms. Stewart about them uh, being available for magistration? I have not, Mr. Ponton, because that's not a magistration issue. It is an issue of the fact that the sheriff is refusing to allow admission until they're magistrated. And like I stated before, magistrates have a 24 to 48 hour window before they can respond. And you have responded to this before. You brought up, you have actually shared three Texas Attorney General's opinions that simply said they don't have the, the, the Sheriff's Department, it's a shall admit to jail post-magistration. The first time this concern about his civil, civil liability issue has arisen was in your September 3rd letter, I believe. And if you research the law, I've got a case, uh, Busby, it says that as long as the, it says the jail, the, the sheriff of a jail has to entrust his sheriff to the, his, his duties to the jailers. And as long as he's not a part of the act, of the criminal act of arresting someone unlawfully or, uh, or uh, messing with their rights after they get into jail, he is not going to be held liable and neither is the county. So that's not the issue here. The issue is the fact that he's absolutely abusing his office to make sure that these, that the Alpine Police Department is crippled. That's something I wouldn't be here today if you had done what I think you should have done. How could, what, do you, what, uh, what authority do you have to order the sheriff to, to admit people uh, into his jail before they're magistrated? I do not. That's what why I'm taking the what, what, okay, opinion. Okay. And that's why I sought to meet with the sheriff who refused to meet with me, then, Mr. Ponton. I said let, it, was not, it was not illegal to do it. Let me ask you this question. What authority do I have as city attorney to order the sheriff to admit people into his jail pre-magistration? You don't have an authority to order him, but you certainly have an authority to uh, investigate the case and uh, protect the rights of the city of Alpine, which has not happened or else I would not be here tonight, Mr. Ponton. Well, I, I, I disagree with you, Ms. Wilson. Okay, so we can go back and forth. Okay. Eric, could you can yeah. share a little bit about the history of the jail and what, uh, in your meeting uh, with Judge Cano, his acknowledgement about uh, where the responsibility for the jail lies and how we came to that point? Uh, I did have a meeting with Mr. Cano. He was pretty, um, irritated acting during the meeting. He insisted on recording it. So I just asked him a couple of questions before he left, mainly that um, when this jail was built, I believe it's when judge, uh, when the current county judge at that time was Val Beard, I believe she met with this current city manager, which I apologize, I don't know the name. And they Bill agreed- Bill Soule was the mayor. Bill okay. Soule was the mayor at the time. And they agreed that if the the, county could build that jail on city land at the time, which I think has been sold to the county by now, that um, people could be, the Alpine Police Department could admit their people into jail without uh, any problems. And, and that's, that's how it's always been. It's always been that way up until March of uh, 2020 of this year. So I cannot understand what the sudden change was, and I do not understand why uh, he's only picking on one agency. That's, that's, a, that's a big question because Alpine City and the residents of Alpine, they're the ones at risk. And this is a big issue. Okay. Councillor Stevens, okay. I did con confirm that with Judge Beard, uh, that that agreement uh, had been made between her and Mayor Soule. Uh, and then uh, Judge Cano confirmed that uh, in the meeting that, that Sandy Wilson held. So it's like many items between the city and the county, whether it's fire department, et cetera, 
we share to be able to reduce cost. In this case, what I'm hearing stating is that the sheriff has made a unilateral decision uh, that goes against the agreement that was put in place that originally established the basis for building the jail. That is correct. Thank okay, you. Could, do we have a, a copy of the written agreement or was this just a verbal? I believe it was just verbal. Just a verbal. Judge, Judge Beard confirmed that they did not memorialize it in writing, uh, but uh, Judge Cano did confirm that he was aware of, of that verbal agreement uh, between the city and the county. So uh, I presume there'll be action, Eric, to get that documented. So that issue goes away. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Eric, if, if I can offer maybe um, another viewpoint, it seems to me like um, there are some definitely serious issues between the, the county and the city. Uh, but as mentioned by the judge, the important thing is protection of our residents, especially if uh, somebody is arrested who is questionable and can if let go or escapes can cause damage out there. And does the city have any... Um, let's say adequate or standardized uh, location where it can be used as a holding tank until the individual can be uh, magistrated? Or in case of a serious issue, it, will the individual, can the individual be transported to another uh, facility? And if so, it, it's a cost effective. So we do not have any holding cells. Um, from a city perspective. And uh, if, if we did transport them, yes, there would be uh, cost associated with that. Is there any chance of... Uh, and and actually, I think Sandy Wilson can identify whether we could even take them across county line or the magistrate. I, I think in a situation like that, and I, I think even Mr. Ponton would agree with me, they would have to get some permission you know, from the other counties. I do know that prior to magistration, the liability of any incident happening with that arrested person lies with the arresting agent. But post uh, magistration, if the sheriff still refuses to admit them, then the liability is going to lie on the county. It, it seems like we, we're having a little uh, political differences here between the sheriff and, and uh, APD. And perhaps we need to get a mediator to sit down with them to come to an agreement or an understanding. Because uh, since the city does not have a holding cell or anything, and yeah, I'm seeing both sides of, of, of the coin here. You know, the sheriff, that's a liability on me if, if something happens uh, to that individual or if he's forgotten about it, he doesn't get magistrated within the allotted time. So, I mean, I, for one, will sit down, if need be, between the two parties as a private citizen to come to a resolve on this issue. I think that's a good idea. I mean, we have to work together. That's very important. Well, I, I just got to tell you, from my perspective, when you have a sheriff who changes the frequencies on the radio to make them encrypted and not allow communication between APD, Saul Ross, and, uh, and the sheriff. In my mind, this is not a practice that we should accept. It's not about resolution. It's about a direct affront from the sheriff's office to Alpine Police Department. And, and in my view, one can take it no other way. Uh, I, I recall we on council saw the notice from the sheriff it was not pre-coordinated, it was not discussed, it was just issued. Uh, when we think about what's gone on in communication, it was not pre-coordinated, it was not the opportunity. Uh, when you have a, a law enforcement agency who refuses to help others in need, that is not working together, it's an attitudinal issue. So uh, uh, I don't see any way in which a negotiation is gonna solve this problem, I would all also, I suspect we're going to get into some of this discussion uh, as part of the presentation. I know we're going to have an executive session uh, because, as uh, the district attorney said, there are some 
uh, there's an investigation underway, which we cannot talk about in open forum. That was my suggestion to try to get some kind of result. We just can't go on uh, in there. You know, uh, Rick, I understand what you're saying, but still we need to get this issue resolved one way or another. Well, I, so I can tell you, Andy, I've been approached uh, about having a discussion as well. And so far that meeting hasn't occurred uh, despite my best efforts to reach out to be able to dialogue. So uh, there's, there's been lots of attempts and we are now uh, six months into this and still no resolution. Uh, and from a liability standpoint, my concern is the city's going to have to expend funds to build a jail because it appears that at least one of the parties is not honoring the agreement, even though the county judge, the current county judge, acknowledges that agreement is in place. And as I said, I think there's investigatory things underway that I'm not privy to, but our uh, district attorney has stated there are some issues. We're gonna to have to rely on the DA to go work that. Okay. <laughs> Holly, time to move on to the next item. I think the mayor dropped back off. Uh oh. Okay. I don't see him. Uh, he's coming back on. Oh, there he is. Okay, Andy. We gotta get gotta get your internet work done, Andy. We can't hear you. Unmute him, please. I've got two computers side by side, and the one on the Zoom is the one that's cutting out on me. Uh oh. Yep. So I don't know what it is. They both have good, strong signals and everything. I talked to your ISP. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> retired from them, I think. <laughs> Should have some pull. Yep. I had pull. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the outages take longer and longer. Yep. Well, I have just one question. I just, I just want clarification on one thing. Who is over the sheriff? The voters or over the sheriff <laughs> and then if he's committing an illegal act uh, that's that's uh, a, that'll become a criminal investigation and i believe he's committed some illegal acts here and you know he he only he his only his only bosses are his constituents unless he's committing an illegal act thank you okay any more questions Item number nine. A brief statement of facts, including where funds are coming from, if applicable. Action items limited up to 10 per meeting. After being called upon by the mayor or mayor pro tem, citizens are required to state their name and ward in which they reside. Priority will be given to the citizens of Alpine and those who own business or property in the city. Individuals who do not live in or own businesses or property in the city limits of Alpine will be allowed to speak if there's time available. And item number one, city. Honorable Mayor and City Council, item number one is to discuss, consider, and approving uh, and adopting the 2020 2021 tax year proposed tax rate for the city of Alpine, Texas, by ordinance 2020 year 08 year 01, a tax rate of 0. 0.553. 753 per $100 valuation has been recommended for fiscal year 2020 2021. Maintenance and operations is 0.512833, and interest in sinking is 0 0.04092. Um, the motion will need to, to be read uh, as stated in our agenda, and I would recommend a roll call, call vote on this this evening. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I propose that City Council approve and adopt the 2020-2021 tax year proposed tax rate for the City of Alpine, Texas by Ordinance 2020-08-01, a tax rate of 0 0.553753 per $100 valuation, uh, which has been recommended for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. Maintenance on operations is 
0.512833 with interest and sinking is 0 0.04092. And uh, we did a name roll call at the last meeting as well to comply with the uh, ordinance or Texas uh, rules on this. Okay. Do I hear a second on this? A second. Okay, motion's been made and second. Do the roll call start with you, Councilman Stevens. Aye. Aye, you vote in favor of it. Yes. Okay. Uh, Betty. Aye. Aye, okay. And Councilman uh, Belmont. Uh, yes, I, I approve. Okay, and I, I'm sorry, and I skipped Councilman, Esc Councilperson Escobedo. I approve. Okay, and now we have uh, Councilman Maria Kirk. I approve. What's that? I approve. Okay, very good. Thank you. And opposing. Okay, motion carries. Thank you all very much. Uh, item number two um, in your packet is to discuss, consider, and take appropriate action on resolution 2020-09-15 to accept the recommended solicitation of brokers on the submitted broker list as required by our investment policy. I did include backup in your packet uh, to review ahead of time as well. Apparently entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I propose that we approve resolution 2020-09-15 to accept the recommended solicitation of brokers on the submitted broker list as required by our investment policy. Okay, entertain a second. I'll second. Okay, motion made and second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, oppose, like sign. Motion carries, thank you all very much. City Manager. Yes, sir, uh, item number three is to discuss, consider, and take appropriate action on resolution 2020-09-16 to approve strategies and guidelines to invest according to our investment policy. I did include a uh, cover sheet, uh, the resolution, and additional information in your packet. Okay. Mayor, I, yes, uh, I propose we approve resolution 2020-9-16, approve the strategies and guidelines to invest according to our investment policy for the city of Alpine. Okay, do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay, motions made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, like sign, motion carries. Okay, city manager. All right, another one. Uh, item number four is to discuss, consider, and take appropriate action on the recommendations on the Woodward lease uh, at the airport. Uh, did include information in your packet. Uh, the airport advisory board has uh, also approved the recommendation. Their resolution uh, approving that is in your packet as well. Is there a motion? Yes, so, sir. Mr. Mayor, I propose we approve uh, uh, the Woodward lease at the airport. Okay, is there a second? Hey, let me give me some time here. <laughs> okay, motion made and seconded. <laughs> Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Thank you. City Manager. Honorable Mayor and City Council. Uh, next item on the, on the list is item number five to discuss, consider, and take appropriate action approving resolution 2020 09 02 to adopt the official newspaper for fiscal year 2020 2021. Uh, we did have uh, this discussion uh, at the last council meeting and went back and gathered more information. Uh, that additional information was included in this week's packet as well. Uh, I know several folks have, have had reach outs from community members too. Okay, I'll entertain the motion. So Mr. Mayor, just to get the dialogue going, because I know it's going to be an interesting dialogue. Yes, it is. <laughs> I, uh, 
I would propose that the uh, City uh, Council approve resolution 2020-09-02 to adopt the Big Bend Sentinel as the official paper for fiscal year 2021. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, any discussion? So I, since, since I made the motion and I know there's gonna be lots of, of dialogue here, uh, I've gotten considerable feedback and I know we've all seen uh, emails that have come to all of us uh, in support of uh, the, uh, the Alpine Avalanche. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a subscriber to both the Avalanche and the Big Bend Sentinel. And no matter what decision council makes, that's not gonna change my position regarding that. When I ask people about their recommendations, what the rationale has been, the consistent answer coming back has been that the Big Bend Sentinel does a better job reporting on city and specifically city council matters, uh, and they feel better informed uh, about that. And when they look to what's going on, they look to the Big Bend Sentinel for their uh, primary information. That's not to say that the Avalanche doesn't have information out there, because uh, they have, uh, but uh, the Big Bend Sentinel has really stepped up. And so that's the predominant feedback I've gotten at least across Ward 5 because uh, I have a number of people that have spoken to me. So those are my comments uh, and that's the rationale. I have gotten the same feedback from everybody in my, you know, that's responded in my ward. Okay, anybody else? And I've gotten the opposite feedback uh, from a cross section of town. Also the Alp Alpine Avalanche has been here since 1890. Mm -hmm. It's a homegrown newspaper. The owners live in Alpine, they shop in Alpine, they support Alpine. Uh, all the school, all the school events, they're there as the booster. Mm -hmm. They do provide the information that, that's needed uh, from city council and uh, what folks need to know, and I believe that they do it truthfully, and, and uh, they're very fair about it in their reporting. Now, we always talk about shopping Alpine. This is moving in the opposite direction. This is moving to another town. So I strongly recommend that since we're always saying we need to shop Alpine, we need to stay with the avalanche. Uh, like I say, homegrown newspaper, and they're deeply entrenched in Alpine uh, as a community. It's a great community uh, a friend. So my recommendation is to go with the app. Anybody else? Uh, um, yes, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Yes, Mayor, um, as city councilor for Ward 2, I also choose to designate the Alpine Avalanche as the official newspaper the city. Okay, thank you, sir. Anybody else? I agree with Ramon and with you, Mayor. Uh, working back uh, when I used to work for the Chamber of Commerce for 10 years, um, shopping at home was the biggest thing, economic development here, keeping our money here. So the Alpine Avalanche is my choice. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Betty. Uh, I agree with everybody. I, I think the avalanche should be the main paper from here. Okay. Any more discussion? Yeah, the, Let's the, put the it one, to a... Yes, sir. The, the, the one point that I uh, would like to make, and, you know, it's uh, either paper is going to service. I think there are two points that I think are important from my perspective. One, I think the avalanche needs to step up its game. Uh, because, I, as I said, I think the reporting that we're seeing out of the Big Bend Sentinel, particularly about this meetings, these meetings here, is far better than what goes in the avalanche. The second point I would make is I understand JT's frustration uh, in the note that he, uh, that he sent to us, uh, but I would like to make uh, two particular comments about it. It says he was personally embarrassed. It says he was blindsided. I know there's been discussions going back and forth with JT since June and July on this. And we, we opened this dialogue in August. It's a little bit bothersome that there would be the combative nature as opposed to answering the question, 
hey, I hear you. We got a strong message. How do we improve? Uh, because I think we are not served well when we have a paper that looks and says, I'm entitled, as opposed to I've got to earn it. And last I checked, I don't think anyone's guaranteed a job anywhere. We do, in fact, have to go earn it. I think the second item, and I'm looking at our package, which you all have the opportunity to look at, is the dialogue back and forth with uh, Mike Hodges at, uh, at the uh, Texas uh, Press. A and would say, hey, even Mike made a comment, sent a letter out that it didn't go to us. It, uh, it appeared to go to JT. And then after a push back and forth with Eric, we finally got it. I just think uh, if we're going to play the game and play above board, we have an expectation that our city newspaper is going to be above board uh, and on the table. And, and I would hope that they would step up their game regardless of the outcome, because fundamentally, I do believe that the avalanche ought to be the paper. My struggle is I think they've taken it for granted. That's my piece. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Okay, all those in favor, one sentinel, raise your hand. I see one, Ms. Curry. Okay, that's two. All right. Okay, and let's, how about the avalanche? Raise your right hand. I see one, two, three. Okay, uh, it seems like the avalanche by one vote, so we will continue to go with the avalanche and Perhaps then, uh, like you say, Councilman, he'll step up uh, to the game, to the plate, and we'll get Mayor, more and better coverage. Yeah, Mayor, just sir. Order. Somebody is going to have to make a motion to amend. Right. Uh, the the, the motion. Motion, and then that amendment is going to have to be approved, uh, and then the motion would have to be approved. Right. Okay. Will anybody make the um, motion to amend? We'll make a motion to amend. Okay, to amend it to what? To adopt the Alpine Avalanche as the official newspaper for the fiscal year 2020-2021, resolution 2020-09-02. Okay, is there a second on it? I second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Okay, all those in favor of the new motion, raise your right hand. One, two, three. I see three. Opposed? See one. Ms. Curry, I, I don't see you on the screen. I'm here. Raising okay. my hand. I, I see your hand now. Okay. Okay. The motion carries. It's three to two. Okay. So the amendment carried. So now you've got to... You've got to have another vote, Mayor. Okay. You've got to approve... Yes, sir. The action item with the amend okay. amendment. Yep. The amendment to the to the action item. Correct. Okay. I will you, entertain that. You wanna, Cynthia, maybe you can read back the motion and the amendment. You don't mind? Uh, the amendment was made by Councilor Escobedo to adopt resolution 2020-0902 to adopt the official newspaper. Um, as the avalanche for the fiscal year 2020-2021. And it was seconded by Councillor Olivas. And so that's amending? That's amending. Okay. The amendment. So now we need, we need to vote on the first motion to discuss, discuss consider, and take appropriate action uh, to adopt the official newspaper. Okay, and that motion had been made and seconded. Correct. Motion was Correct. made. So uh, on this Big Ben Sentinel, and then it was amended to the Alpine Avalanche. Correct. Right. Make sure we so get all this on record. To make, okay. To make sure that everyone understands it. Correct. The amend the first amend motion was to adopt the Sentinel as the newspaper. Correct. 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 Okay. So we need a vote on that motion, up or down. Correct. No. 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 You amended that motion. Right. Okay. You amended that motion 
renaming the selected paper to Alpine Avalanche. Okay. So the motion will be on um, item six or item five rather would be the Avalanche in. Correct. To vote on that, right? Voting on this. Okay. So I will entertain that motion then. Well, it was already motion and second, and so you'll just take a take a vote on it now. Okay. Now it's the amendment was to make the uh, avalanche the newspaper of record. So that's what we're voting on. Correct. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. So all those. Any discussion on this? Any more discussion? Seeing none. Okay. All those that favor the motion of a avalanche okay. as a as a newspaper of record, raise your right hand. Okay, see one. Uh, Betty, you voting two? Ramon, where are you at? I don't see you. Got his hand high. <laughs> He's got his pen there too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all those opposed, raise your hand. One, two. Okay, the motion carries. And so the Alpine Avalanche will be the newspaper. Thank you all right, very much. You know, and a great first article might be uh, uh, an article on Robert's Rules of Orders and amending uh, motions that are made. And getting yeah. that out. I would suggest that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm a way rusty on those things. Okay, let's move on to item six. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, Mayor and City wow. Council, item six is to discuss, consider, and take appropriate action on the recommendations from the Hotel Occupancy Tax Committee on the Hotel to Occupancy Tax allocations uh, for this upcoming fiscal year. Uh, really surrounding the events, we had uh, information in your packet. Uh, Laura Gold, who presented earlier this evening, is also on that Hotel Occupancy Tax Committee, so she's one who helped uh, create those recommendations. Uh, but in your packet, you have the original requests from the events and then spreadsheet two was what the recommendation was from the committee. Okay. Yes, so, sir. So Mr. Mayor, I propose that the uh, city council approve the recommendations from the hotel occupancy tax uh, committee on the hotel occupancy tax fund allocation of $180,000 for fiscal year uh, for the next fiscal year, leaving a reserve of approximately $1 million. Very good. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion's made and seconded. Any discussion? So, 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 so yes, not being you know, part of the discussions, I know there was 215,000 that was proposed uh, and I might have missed it in the reading. Uh, we, we went from 215 to 180, what was the 25,000 uh, or 35,000 rather that was pulled off? Can you just comment, Eric? Yeah, the biggest item really was Cowboy Poetry Gathering. They had requested close to 50,000, uh, committee recommended 25. Uh, that was uh, primarily due to them uh, going to promote a virtual event this year. They're not going to do a, a live in-person event. Gotcha. And as the committee looked through it and talked through it, they, they felt like that was, that was uh, a better allocation. Okay, and, and was there any feedback from uh, Cowboy Poetry on that? Do we know? Uh, I don't know. I've got, let me unmute Chris real quick. Chris, uh, you, yeah, I got any feedback? I, I have not, but I haven't actually spoken with them. I haven't, uh, I haven't worked back with them. I apologize. Okay. I'm back. So, so uh, th thanks, Chris. You know, my sense is, you know, we have, uh, we got a great allocation. We got the roughly million dollars available. Uh, so I presume, you know, we as council and the hotel activity tax committee will be ready to listen to any reasonable requests uh, because we want to bring business back in Alpine. It's nice that we've got the flexibility to go do that. Certainly, yeah, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that, you know, we're going to want to do is just kind of set what that, uh, real reserve amount needs to look like, you know, is that four or $500,000 and then, uh, you know, actively work to, 
make sure we're, we're supporting events and doing other advertising um, as the, the economy starts growing back here. Yep. Okay. Yeah, if I may, uh, Council, uh, the, the other change, the, the remaining $10,000 change was in uh, the Fiesta of Our Lady of Peace, uh, Fiesta, uh, their event. It turned out the event actually was in the 2021-22 fiscal year. So their promotion of the arts request actually could not be awarded for the event date they were asking. So uh, the committee awarded them a small amount for advertising that we would encourage them to promote the event uh, leading up to it. And then next year's appropriation, they, that, uh, that request could be considered. They could afford. Uh, in, in respect to that last uh, comment, um, <clears throat> I'm a little bit um, skeptical as to the, the small amount uh, for advertising for the uh, Lady of Peace uh, Catholic Church for their event. They requested $10,000, uh, but they're only going to get, apparently the recommended amount was $500 for promotion. And to be honest with you, the $500 won't even, it'll just cover minimal promotion and basically at a local level. Uh, and second, I, I was lucky enough to be the, uh, the MC for that activity uh, last year. And the activity ex uh, exhibited cultural interchange, uh, cultural activities, children's games and children's activities as well. And it was basically a family oriented uh, activity with people not only from Alpine, but from outside of Alpine as well. And, and this year to see this, that I've requested 10,000 and only 500, seems to me a little bit low. And of course, not knowing what the HOTS committee uh, purpose or the um, guidelines or the uh, bylaws are, it's, it's uh, a little difficult to grasp. Well, I, I can I can explain it uh, exactly. It, the uh, the five hundred dollars actually. So the ten thousand dollars that was requested by the event was specifically for promotion of the arts. So they were asking for funds to pay the entertainers at the time of the event. But because the event is is in October twenty twenty two, it doesn't actually fall in this fiscal year. So the committee could not give them that money now because they were asking for an event that doesn't occur in the fiscal year that we're funding. And so they can come back with the exact same application next year and get funded. But because of the date, we can't appropriate funds for the 2021-22 fiscal year. I mean, sorry, the 2020-2021 fiscal year, the fiscal year we're looking at right now. We can't appropriate those funds for an event that happens in the following year. So that, that was the issue. So the, the, that, it just couldn't be spent now. And so the committee, uh, the event actually did not ask for any advertising money. So the committee awarded some promotional funds uh, to assist leading in with the intention that when the next round of funding comes in for the 2021-22 fiscal year, that the event would come back with the same request and it could be funded because that's the appropriate year when the money would be spent. Did anyone on a committee ever consider that maybe what was submitted was in, a mistake and try to reach the, uh, the promoter or the organizers for the event for clarification? Because I spoke to uh, um, an individual and they said, the only request was submit something we did and never heard any, uh, never got any word uh, prior during the selection recommendation phase or the, the, the final outcome? Well, uh, I was, I've been uh, available to anyone to, uh, and so when I've been requested to answer questions, et cetera, I've, I've been available. And uh, uh, Mrs. Campbell, I certainly worked with her in the previous year, and so uh, she did not reach out to me with any uh, with any questions or ask me for any input. So I, I didn't uh, proactively reach out to everyone, but I have been available to anyone who uh, who had any questions for me. 
Uh, but you didn't take it upon yourself to question uh, the request and maybe ask her if there might have been a mistake. Uh, I did not, no. Thank you. Okay. Are there any more questions, comments? I'm, I, I have a comment. I'm just wondering if on that application that Ramon's talking about, if that can be fixed with the, I'm, I'm assuming that it's just a problem with the, or an error with the date. Chris? Oh yeah, well, yeah. If, uh, they, uh, if they if 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 they were looking to do an event this year and not next fiscal year, then um, yeah, the committee can come back together and look at it. I think the committee was very supportive of the event. The only reason it got moved over is because it was uh, on the application it was scheduled for for the next fiscal year. In fact, it was John Green on the committee that actually called that out. Would it be possible for uh, someone to call Mrs. Campbell and try to get some clarification on this? Yeah, we uh, we call all of the folks after uh, council renders their decision. Thank you. Yeah, my put on this is we've got, you know, we can go ahead and approve it then as I think we're all amenable uh, to strategies going forward. We, we certainly have financial flexibility with this. Mm -hmm. I don't think the city's ever seen a million dollars available in the hotel ISB tax fund. So uh, I think probably two things we want to ask the hot committee to do is one, uh, answer the question, Ramon, that, uh, that you raised and Lucy that you raised. And then the second is to go back and look and say, hey, what's the strategy that they think the city ought to adopt uh, relative to funds expenditures once the economy starts coming back and we're ready to open our doors. We still have two more at-large positions uh, for that committee that uh, council can can recommend individuals in the community on too. So okay. team, the team did a great job when they, they came together and met. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay, seeing none. Those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Okay, Ramon, okay, I see yours. <laughs> Eddie? Okay, Maria. Did you see my hand? For some reason. Yeah, okay, all righty. The motion carries by unanimous decision. Okay, City Council member comment answers. We'll start with you, Rick. Sure. Hey, thanks, Mayor. Uh, as always, these are great meetings, great opportunity for discussion. Uh, you know, frankly, we always don't agree, uh, which is fine, but these are the right things. I think getting things on the table, being able to have an open uh, discussion about items we may or may not be aware of is important. So thanks very much for the engagement. And, you know, thanks uh, again for the great reports that got put on the table uh, uh, across the board, because the, uh, the quality of those reports, in my view, is phenomenal. So thanks. Great comment, uh, Councilman. Okay, Council Person Escobedo. I just want to say thank you to everybody for attending. Okay, uh, Fit Council Person Fitzgerald. I think it was a good meeting. Councilman Ramon Olivas. Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Uh, good meeting. I, um, uh, we have challenges ahead and some issues that we need to certainly look into and we'll work to make, resolve them. I'd like to make two comments. Uh, one is I recently attended the, the 29th Annual uh, Binational History Conference in San Elisario, Texas. And much of the focus was on the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, which extends from Mexico City all the way to uh, uh, and it's, it's part now of the World Heritage Program. Mexico did a tremendous job in getting it now recognized in the World Heritage. But of course, the Camino Real extends from Mexico City all the way to El Pueblo San Juan, just north of, um, of Española. In attending this meeting, I had an opportunity to, to get together with uh, friends, colleagues from the tourism, government, and education uh, department. And it was fantastic. I mean, I learned a lot. And um, 
but more so the initiative that it seems that Mexico is now taking in promoting binational tourism. And also, um, which is something we need, might want to keep in mind as we get more into developments and um, initiatives in dealing in our dealings across from Okinawa to uh, Alpine to Fort Stockton. The second thing I'd like to bring up is I recently heard that on NBC News and <clears throat> that uh, NMSU, University of Albuquerque, the New Mexico State and Fish uh, Department have questions about why the migratory birds are dying. And apparently, it, we're not talking about hundreds of birds that are just are being found in the fields dead. We're talking, they're saying hundreds of thousands. And how it, might that affect us? Something we need to want to keep in mind. That's it. Thank you very much. So very informative. And yes, uh, due to those wildfires, they're already reaching the East Coast and causing some issues out there as far as uh, the air quality. So that's affecting them. Right now, we're not affected because of the flow of the wind, the, the, the jet stream. But the possibilities are there. And that's why it's very important also to watch our own backyard about fires. OK, it's Curry. Um. Thanks, everybody. Those are, those are great discussions and fantastic reports. Okay, hey, thank you, ma'am. And it was a good meeting. You know, we agree to disagree, but in the final, we back together again, as, as Rick said, and we're elected to serve the city and the constituents here to do the right thing. Uh, so again, I want to thank the council for that. And everyone have a good evening, and we're going to go to executive you, session. Mayor, before y'all go into executive session, I needed to bring a couple of points to your attention. Um, and I've checked on this with the uh, Texas uh, Attorney General's Office uh, open meetings lawyers. And you can note on the executive session when you say pursuant to section 551.071 of the government code consultation with attorney, that is the provision that protects the city council when you go into a closed session from otherwise going into an illegal closed session. And so when you go into an executive session, you need to go into the executive session with the city attorney, me. Now, also the issue is who, can, who else can attend the executive session? For instance, the executive session number one is the discussion of the Alpine Police Department internal investigation. Well, in checking with the Attorney General's office, if, if, if you're dealing with a person in executive session, that person should be there. So if you're dealing with the Alpine Police Department, it would be proper for Chief Martin to attend the executive session. But you would not allow other staff members, for instance, the city secretary, not attend a, an executive session unless the executive session is directed at her. She's the object of the executive session. And then finally, when y'all go into the second executive session item, discussion of municipal prosecutor, I submitted a letter to the, all of y'all today because under 551.074, if the person that you're gonna discuss requests that the matter be heard in open session, y'all are required to hold it in open session. So I request that the executive session number two not be held, that it be held in open session for the discussion regarding the municipal prosecutor and city attorney. Okay, sir. So you wish to remove it from executive session and put it into the regular general session, correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. All right, then. I guess I didn't have to do that for you, sir. So, 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 Mr. Mayor, since yes, I'm the sir. one that proposed both of these items into an executive session, mm -hmm. I would propose that City Council adjourn from the public session and go into executive session to cover the item of discussion of the Alpine Police Department internal investigation related to the recent case in the media that we exclude the city attorney and that we not cover item number two. Okay. I'll 
Once again, I point out that to exclude the city attorney ex takes away your reason to have the executive session because the executive session, as you know from your notice, is to consult with the city attorney. In, in this case, we're consulting on with the uh, district attorney. You're, the, 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 it's a, for, on a matter for which it is the duty of the city attorney. You, you consult with the so city Rod, attorney. Rod, Rod, I, have, I, have a, I have an attorney client privilege with y'all and that's the reason y'all are able to go into executive session. I, I understand that, okay? If you'd like us to just cancel the meeting, we'll redo a special meeting to exclude you. We do not need the city attorney in this discussion. I'm just telling you what the Attorney General and what the Open Meetings Act says, that if you go into an executive session to discuss matters with the city attorney, the city attorney is supposed to attend. So the city council has the ability to appoint special counsel and exclude the city attorney. If you would like us to appoint a special counsel, we will do that and exclude you from executive session at a future meeting. That's, that's the wish of the council. I'm just telling you that the- I understand. The, the, the last two meetings, y'all have had executive sessions excluding me from it, and you can't have closed sessions without the lawyer. Okay, that then- violates we, the Open Meetings Act. I, I, Rod, I understand exactly what you're saying. Okay, we will not go into executive session. Council will decide on its own whether to get special counsel or not, and that does not require you. All right. Okay, and that's according to Texas law. And that's according to the city charter. Wait, I'm okay. So, okay. Are we will get a council, another attorney for us for executive session. So, I would propose that the city council adjourn at this point, and we will call a special meeting for the future. I'll second. Motion has been made and second. Any more discussion on this? Okay, we will not have an executive session till further notice and so or I will ask for a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. I think you've already got the motion. Okay, motion made second. Second. Okay, then second. Any discussion? The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.